Hosea was married to a woman named Gomer. They have their first child. Hosea is looking at this baby and suddenly he begins to realize, I ain't the daddy. They have another child. Hosea looks at the second child and realizes, I ain't the daddy. Hosea is beginning to realize, my wife is a prostitute, basically. In fact, it gets so bad that her, quote, lovers bring her down to the slave market to sell her to the highest bidder. Hosea goes down to the slave market and barters against other men to buy back his wife. He outbids the other men. He buys back his wife. And as he's walking with her home, he says, I have bought you at a high price. I love you. I plead with you. Be my wife. And God is teaching Hosea a lesson. God is saying, Hosea, do you know the pain that you experience over your wife's sexual unfaithfulness? Well, that is the same way I, God, feel. Because human beings who I created and gave them the gift of life, to celebrate life, to enjoy life, who I created to love me and to live in relationship with me, have turned their backs on me. They've gone after idols. They prostituted themselves to the highest bidder. And I hurt. But my love is hesed, is the Hebrew word. Faithful love. I love with a faithful love, and I'm seeking to woo people back to myself. Well, you will have no more graphic depiction of the love of God than in Hosea. I do want to focus on what you said about morality. It's not necessary to be a nihilist, nor to be a moral relativist to be an atheist. Uh, it, it does not logically follow that all actions are equal, nor that we cannot appeal to a moral authority without appealing to God. We can appeal to the moral authority that exists as Sorry. a consequence of evolution and its processes. I mean, so many of our notions of right and wrong stem from evolution. I mean, there's a field of it. And it doesn't make sense to, to say, oh, we have to jump over. All of that is irrelevant. God placed that there to test our faith. I mean, really, you have to say that a test of our faith would go as far as every field of science showing no conclusive evidence for God's existence. But just pointing again to morality, it, it, it makes no sense. It, I, I mean, you can appeal to a moral system based on science. Sam Harris does that and very successfully. So why does it have to be God? How does Sam Harris say that you can have an objective moral if there is no God? He doesn't use the term objective because that, that, Good. that's too broad. But so that's it's first, subjective. As humans, as humans, we can say it's something close enough to objective that we can use this as a basis. And one of the bases, bases is suffering. Suffering is a pretty good way to measure how we should act morally. Yes. So, I mean, suffering is pretty measurable. Someone dying is suffering. It doesn't have to go into an existentialist or, you know, com completely philosophical argument for you to argue about what's moral and what's immoral. Like one of the tools you use is examining suffering. Okay, so what does suffering tell you is good and what does suffering tell you is evil? Well, evolutionarily, we're rewarded for not causing suffering to our brothers and sisters, for, for people close to us genetically. It's, it's, it's something we've been rewarded for, which has followed through. It, it's followed through for so long because it's evolutionary, evolutionarily beneficial for us to do that. And now I'm not a moral relativist. I don't believe that that means that all actions done outside the, the sphere of humanity become equal. That, that's not the case. But we do have a metric to use, and that metric is thousands of years of the evolutionary process, what's worked best for us. And one of the things that's worked best for us is not allowing massive suffering in our own species. You don't have to dictate outside of that because we're dealing with human affairs. So then your morality is based on majority opinion. How is it based on majority opinion? Us. We've agreed. We've reached a place evolutionarily 
from the we're at the level of the evolutionary ladder where we've agreed that this is right and this is wrong. Isn't that what you're saying? It, it's somewhat irrelevant from evolution specifically, but yes, we can make conclusions just as we can make political conclusions. Yeah. And I would argue that whether you chose to vote for Romney or Obama does not involve a moral absolute or an objective moral. Yes, you don't need objective morals. You, right. you can have a system you appeal to and say, this is as close to objective as we're going to get. Okay. But you don't have to say that there exists some overlying right. ob objective system. And that, that is one of the cruxes of your argument for God, that we all have some innate response to morality or, or to moral questions that is so similar it has to be God. No, my argument is every atheist and every agnostic and every theist understands from experience that there are objective morals, moral absolutes, like the abuse of an innocent child is never good. It is always evil. Do you agree or disagree? I don't believe in objective morality, so I... And, and that doesn't mean I believe that all things are equal, but I, I, won't, I won't say that in all instances for every animal or a, anything... For every ch occurs, abused child. You don't think that... You think it's possible for the abuse of an innocent child to be good? No, because I have my own moral system. My moral system would not facilitate me reasoning that to be okay, so I can't right. understand from other perspectives. But you that understand anything. that your moral system is just a personal taste, the same way you might prefer the taste of broccoli to asparagus, that's just a taste. Well, and so your taste tells you, I prefer not abusing children to abusing children. It's just a in, taste. It's not an objective moral. It's dependent upon your taste. But like a taste, it's dependent on, it, it is the result of processes of evolution. There's a reason that we don't appreciate people abusing children because that hurts the survival of our species and we are not rewarded by doing that. I mean, it's another Great. reason that we, that we discourage homosexuality and why it's so pervasive in religious literature. Yes. That doesn't facilitate the, the, continue, the continued existence of our species. So, But if I enjoy abusing handicapped kids because I think it's best to wipe them out because they are a drain on the few natural resources that we have. system, that doesn't work. Because but if your control. system, but if that's my system, you're not going to tell me I'm wrong, are you? I'm going to say your morals are really messed up. Ooh, that's you are being one arrogant twit. Because your moral system is based on you. And you are putting yourself in a position of superiority, and you're saying that that's your subjective moral, moral system is superior to my Who subjective moral system. Who on this planet does not say precisely that? Exactly. Because you can't live it out, your subjective moral system. You can't live it out. You know very, very well that the abuse of an innocent child is never good. It is always evil, objectively evil. But that's not the case. There's no yes, it is the case. Objectively, in every single case. Well, in every single case, the opposite. you live your life as if the abuse of an innocent child is wrong. I just ask you, if my system of ethics <laughs> says that to abuse handicapped children and wipe them out is good, because we just have a few natural resources. It was Hitler's argument for eugenics. You wipe out handicapped people because they are a drain on your resources. You can't tell him he's objectively wrong. You can say, from my I perspective, don't I don't agree with you, but I have to acknowledge my perspective is subjective. Adolf, Hitler, your sub opinion is objective, is subjective, it's all relative. That doesn't mean they're, they're equally true. And it doesn't mean I have to appeal to an ultimate authority on that issue. I How mean, is your subjective opinion that abusing innocent children is being wrong? How is that true? It's, I don't, if, if you mean ultimately true, nothing's ultimately true because these are ideas. But I will ignore the philosophical element of your question. If you mean how is it true that we should not abuse children, we know that that causes suffering. My moral system is based on eliminating suffering generally. Good. Right? So evolutionarily, that was incredibly important. And if you look at all moral systems, they attempt to do something very similar to this. I mean, you don't find many moral systems that seek only to cause suffering and pain because that's not evolutionarily beneficial. If you allow that meme or whatever genetic cause of you know that meme would, would be to, to continue, then whatever that society is dies very quickly because you have to be able to be facilitative and loving and maintain the All right. harmony in your But if you're going to be consistent with what you say you believe, 
you're going to have to acknowledge that whatever your position is on bashing gays, abortion, and abusing innocent children, the opposite is equally true. No. Yes, you do. By my own, by, I'm saying only by my own moral system. Yeah, but certainly you're not going to be so arrogant as to think that you are right and everybody else is wrong. That's exactly what everyone thinks. No. The, yes. No. No, that those moral relativists who are consistent moral relativists understand. My opinion is bashing gays is wrong. Other people think bashing gays is right. Their opinion is their opinion. My opinion is my opinion. There is no objective moral that says a gay person has worth and value. That's just a societal creation. We can create, That's just a taste. We can create what we will point to as a moral system. Fine. You create your moral system. The Nazi creates his moral system. The white South African creates apartheid. No nobody's right. Nobody's wrong. Systems. It all just is. It's all relative. But I'm not saying that they're. I'm not saying that they're equal systems. You're, you're assuming that because I say that they don't all have some, uh, some monopoly on morality, that, or some monopoly on truth, that they're all equal. I don't no. say that. I'm saying you have no position to say what is true and what is false. You have simply. A, you're in a position to say, for me, this is true. But I understand you have a different definition of truth. I'm not right. You're not wrong. You're not right. I'm not wrong. It just is. Because there's no right and wrong answer to moral questions. That's right. There are moral and immoral answers to moral questions. No, there aren't. There's your definition of moral and immoral Precisely. answers. But I might have a different definition of exactly. moral and immoral. And I'm not right, and you're not wrong, and you're not right, and I'm not wrong. It's all relative you're in your worldview. You're zero or one. This isn't a binary question. So you're saying, oh, well, you know, surely you, you think that all these systems are equal. And I don't, because... But if you're saying, oh, well, how can you just, you know, arbitrarily say your system is the best because every single person does that, especially with religion. You're saying Christianity is the best. I mean, anyone can say that about their religion. You're only Christian because you were brought up here. Excuse me? You want to say, rewind that one. Rewind that one by me one more time, that last sentence. That you're only... Come on, come on, give it to me, bud. That you're only Christian because you were here, born here, or in... Or in how on earth do you know that? How on earth do you know that the only reason I'm a Christian is because I was born in the United States? It's not an attack on your belief. How do you know what you just said? It's an assumption. It is so judgmental, it's scary. I would never treat you that way. That is so disrespectful to do what you just did. You don't have the faintest idea why I'm a follower but, of Christ. But isn't it a statistical problem? I mean, I, I, forgive me. If that's not true, I apologize. You better apologize. That's off the, off the wall, rude. I don't have the faintest idea why you believe what you believe. And for me to assume that you believe what you ever it is you believe, because you were born in the home you were born in, is so judgmental. It's incredible. You don't know that. Okay. And I don't know that. I don't know why you believe what you believe. Were you brought up Christian? Was I brought up Christian? That is pretty pertinent to your belief. The environment I grew up in was Fairfield County, Connecticut. Go check out the environment. Okay, but... I'll tell you what, you want to know what God is in Fairfield County, Connecticut? Money. My buddies go to Wall Street, okay? I can promise you, Jesus is not Lord in Fairfield County. The American dollar is. That's the environment I grew up in. So were you raised Christian? Christian? My mom and dad were followers of Christ, yes. Okay, then my point stands. No, your point does not stand. How not? I just answered the question. You did not, not know question. what my mom and dad believe. And it's highly insulting it was, it was for you to tell me that I'm a Christian because mom and dad are Christians. I highly insulting. That. I was assuming because it's such a high statistical probability in the United States that you were brought up by two Christian parents. <laughs> it's such a pervasive part well, of Well, what's your point? that if you were raised in another time, in another place, you probably would not be Christian with the same belief. You don't know that. Well, you don't have the faintest idea. That is total conjecture on your part. What about a thousand years prior to Jesus' birth? You wouldn't believe in Well, obviously, you'd never heard about Jesus. Precisely. So he you... didn't exist? <laughs> really? What if you're, okay, and, and as you say, if you were in a culture that was never exposed to the story of Jesus, that you wouldn't necessarily go to hell because you just aren't aware. That's right. But in that, within that culture, you could believe something as, as genuinely as you do now with regard to another religion. Of course. And with equally non-existent evidence. Anything's possible. Okay, so... Yeah, okay. So what? What's your point? I'm saying, what are the odds that you happen to be 
born into a culture which facilitated and raised you and to believe something that is objectively true when so many on the planet do not believe the same thing and when your belief system is so specific. You see, I would never treat you the way you're treating me. I would never say, sorry, you know you something, the, way, the reason that you're saying this stuff is, is because statistically you grew up in a certain part of the world that taught this, so therefore you've bought into it. Baloney. You've got your own mind. You can think through things. You can accept what your culture teaches or you can reject it. Guess what? So can I. Right? Yes. It's highly disrespectful for me to say, oh, you're an atheist because you grew up in an atheist home. No. That would be a, a fair, if you want to raise that point, you can, but I wasn't. I friend. would never say that to you, sir. And no, I would I never say to a person, a thinking human being, and the reason you're a Muslim is because you grew up in a Muslim home. That's probably that why. is so disrespectful. No. A Muslim has his own mind. Yes. And she has her own it. mind. She can make up her mind whether she wants to be a Muslim or not. She doesn't have to be Muslim because she grew up well, in a Muslim she'll home. She'll be killed if she's not. Pardon? She'll be killed. I mean, apostates are killed. So that's a good reason to not leave the faith. But my, my point stands. I mean, you're, you're a product of your environment and you believe certain things because so many around you do and because the culture. It okay, are you speaking you about yourself? Yes. That too. I mean, but. Really? But, so well, you honestly believe that you believe what you believe because the culture taught you to and you just well, followed no, your culture? I mean, the United States is not exactly uh, open to atheism, so. Oh, I, I see. So you are an open-minded thinker, but I'm a narrow-minded bigot who just bought into my culture. I never said that. I didn't well, what are you saying? I didn't say that you're a bigot. What are you saying, buddy? I mean, it's so clear what you're saying to me, but go ahead, you clarify. What are you telling me? Why do you believe what you believe and why do I believe what I believe? Well, I don't believe. Oh, yes, you do believe. You very clearly have a world view. You believe something, sir, and so do I. Now, why do you believe what you believe and why do I believe what I believe? That's the path you're going down. Keep going, I'd like to hear this. Well, as someone brought up earlier, we are, aside from being the product of our environment, we're also the product of our parents. A, a good deal of our personality is passed down through there and the way that we yeah. reason is also passed down genetically. Yeah. So is that why you believe what you believe? Because of your environment and your genetics? Yes. No other reason? Well, I mean, the other thing is reasoning through things and evaluating evidence. So. Yeah, would you think that might be a little important? Reasoning through things and but coming to your own decision? Saying, yes. Do you think there might be a few people here on this campus who were raised in a Christian home and who are today agnostic or atheist? Do yes. you think that might happen? I know many. Good. So and you know very, very Christian well that a Christian atheist. is not necessarily a Christian just because they were born in a Christian exactly. parents. You right? And an atheist Christian. is not just an atheist because they were born in an atheist home. Yes. We have our own minds, I'm we can think through issues, likely. and we can come to conclusions. I'm saying it's much, much more likely that, that, that you will be Christian it? when you're Literally. brought Why up that in that bad? kind of home. And it's, I mean, it, it's, it's odd to, to feel that, that by great fortune you happen to be raising the right one without some major alteration to your personal views. Well, isn't it wonderful that you're so fortunate that you have reached the right conclusion while I've reached the wrong conclusion? <laughs> well, I'm not reaching, I'm not making claims about God, so. No, you're making other claims. And please don't act like you're not making claims. I am. Thank you, you sure I'm are. And you're claiming that your claims are true, which means my claims are false. I have no problem with that, but I do have real problems with you liking to appear like you're totally open-minded and tolerant, yeah, I'm, I'm whereas me, I'm some narrow-minded bigot who just bought into my culture or my mommy and daddy. I think that's very unfair and very intellectually dishonest. But I think you're taking this a little too personally. No, I think you've dug a hole and you've chosen to keep on digging. Maybe you should attack people. And I'm scared. You're the one who went on the attack, okay? And I'm trying to show you that you went on the attack and not only did you go on the attack, but your thinking is really unfair. It's not objective. It's really prejudiced. And I don't appreciate that kind of prejudice. Okay, but can we agree that it is a great chance that you happen to be in the United States and not someone growing up in a region of China, for instance, separated from the knowledge of Christ? Why does that matter? There's more Christians in China than the United States. Sir, there are going to be more followers of Christ in China than in any other nation in the world in the next five to ten years. Right. It's because of conversion, sir. Yes. All right. You're exposed to that knowledge. Mao Zedong did one whale of a job suppressing the organized church. The underground church 
exploded. Not because the culture said, hey guys, let's all believe in Jesus. No, the culture said, you believe in Jesus, you better watch out, we're coming after you to kill you. And millions upon millions of Chinese people said, I am sorry. The evidence is Jesus Christ is Lord, and they put their faith in him. Not because mommy and daddy told him to, not because the government told him to, and not because the culture told him to. The culture and mommy and daddy and the government told him the opposite. Not everyone in their society is saying the opposite. Why is it matter? During the rule of Mao Zedong in China, I said the government, everybody. the culture, and mommy and daddy did not encourage people to put their faith in Jesus. Chinese people converted by the millions to faith in Christ because they were choosing to respond to the evidence that Jesus was the truth and the Holy Spirit was working and drawing them to Christ. It's an historical fact. Don't take it from me, go check on it yourself. No, I, I agree with you. My point was, the majority of people stay in their religions because, not necessarily it's convenient, but because they're brought up with such an abundance of information about them. And okay, great, fine. Read the Gospels for yourself, just like the Chinese do. And look at Jesus Christ for yourself. And ask yourself, does the evidence point to Jesus being the truth or not? Don't listen to your culture. Don't listen to me. Don't listen to some preacher or priest. Just search for God for yourself. That's the key. He loves you, man. He loves you so much, he died on a cross for you. He wants you to spend eternity with him in heaven. He really digs you, man. You owe it to yourself to check him out. Does that make sense? Sure. Have you seen the 1962 film classic, To Kill a Mockingbird? It's about a white lawyer named Atticus Finch who lives in the Depression era South. And he's trying to defend a black man named Tom Robinson, who's being, he con is convinced, falsely accused of raping a white woman. It's a classic case of he shed, said versus she said. Atticus Finch realizes there's no way that he's gonna get a fair decision from the jury because the jury is a group of white racists who are confronted by an uneducated black man who's saying, no, I didn't rape the white woman. And then as opposed to him is the white woman who's saying, yes, that man raped me. Atticus Finch understands he stands no chance of winning the case because of the bias and prejudice of the jury. Tom Robinson has no credibility as a black, uneducated man in the Depression-era racist South. If the eyewitnesses of the resurrection were lying, if they were trying to foist a fable on society that the dead Jesus had really risen from the dead, they never would have had their first eyewitness be a woman, Mary Magdalene, and some other women at the empty tomb. Why? Because in first century Palestinian culture, there was horrible sexism and chauvinism. Women were not even allowed to testify in court. So if a group of first century Jewish males are trying to lie that Jesus had risen from the dead, the way to give their account credibility was not to have a woman be the first eyewitness. But the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John have the ring of authenticity as they clearly communicate Jesus rose from the dead. And the first people to see him risen from the dead were women. I like To Kill a Mockingbird. Harper Lee, the author of To Kill a Mockingbird, said once very clearly, the one thing that doesn't abide by majority rule is a person's conscience. In To Kill a Mockingbird, Harper Lee is struggling with the whole issue of conscience. His lawyer, Atticus Finch, played so magnificently by Gregory Peck, is very clear, my conscience convicts me that I must defend this black man who is innocent in spite of the fact that he's going to be run over by a white racist jury. Harper Lee understands Atticus Finch is motivated by his conscience to do what is right instead of what is expedient. To do what is right in spite of the fact that he will lose the case. You and I have consciences and those consciences tie us into what is objectively right. You do not need to believe in God in order to do what's right. But if God does not exist, 
what is right is not objective, it's not absolute, it is purely subjective. It's a taste, similar to your taste in food. Do you prefer pizza to a sandwich? Do you like broccoli or do you like asparagus? A personal taste. Down deep, you and I as human beings know, Atticus Finch did right in defending Tom Robinson, who was being falsely accused of rape. Why do you and I have a conscience? Why is there an objective moral? For one reason, because there's a God, an intelligent mind, a moral lawgiver prior to us human beings, who creates human beings with worth and value, who gives us a conscience that enables us to understand moral absolutes. And we, by exercising those consciences and our rational minds in responsible ways, understand what is good. Look at your own experience of life. You know very well that when someone does you wrong, you look them in the face and say, you should not have done that. When you say that, you're appealing to a standard outside of the two of you. And you're saying, come on, buddy, wake up and smell the, smell the coffee. That was wrong. That is why Jesus Christ died on a cross, because you and I have done wrong. You and I have done that which we should not have done. That's why we experience guilt. Jesus Christ sacrificed his life on the cross to pay the penalty for our wrongdoing, thereby offering us the option of forgiveness, reconciliation with God, and eternal life in heaven. Have you received that gift that God gives you by grace? Have you received Jesus Christ? That is a very simple but very profound decision. You have to be willing, willing to ask Him for forgiveness. You have to be willing to trust in Him, to believe that He died on the cross for your wrongdoing, to reconcile you to God, to give you the gift of eternal life. Are you willing? If you are willing, Christ in His love calls you to Himself. He doesn't ravish you. He doesn't force His way into your life. He doesn't slam truth down your throat. He woos you. He loves you and love waits for a response. Is it not time for you to respond to Jesus Christ by putting your faith and your trust in Him? God bless you as you make that most important decision. I'm the pastor of Grace Community Church. We meet every Sunday morning at 9.30 at Sachs Middle School in New Canaan, Connecticut. Take the Merritt Parkway to exit 37, go to the end of the ramp, take a left onto Route 124, Go approximately one mile and take a right into Sachs Middle School. Won't you join us this Sunday, 9.30, Sachs Middle School, New Canaan, Connecticut. Thanks for joining us for these few minutes. Have a great day.